Hello, and welcome to the Netflix Q4 2020 earnings interview. I'm Spencer Wong, VP of IR and Corporate Development. Joining me today are co-CEO Reed Hastings, co-CEO and Chief Content Officer Ted Sarandos, COO and Chief Product Officer Greg Peters, and CFO Spence Newman. Our interviewer this quarter is Kanan Venkateshwar from Barclays. As a reminder, we'll be making forward-looking statements and actual results may vary. With that, let me turn it over to Kanan for the first question. Thank you, Spencer. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So maybe, Spence, we could start off with you. Um, just given the guidance uh, and the beat uh, during the quarter relative to guidance, sequentially, the first quarter tends to be higher in net additions than Q4. Uh, but your guidance is lower despite the fact that you beat Q4 uh, by a relatively large amount. And it feels like the pull forward effect is more or less behind us. So if you could just help us walk through uh, the thought behind the guidance and the framework that you use for that, that would be a good place to start. Yeah, sure, Kanan. Well, great to see you. Happy New Year, obviously, delayed. Um, so okay, in terms of the guide, you know, first of all, we, we guided to 6 million paid net ads for Q1, as you saw. Um, and, and obviously, that, that's still a big number, especially when you think about it in context of 2020, which was by far a record year with 37 million paid net ads. So. I know you mentioned the pull forward. I, I don't think we're we're declaring that we're necessarily through that yet. So I think um, you know there's puts and calls every quarter, but one that's a, a still a me meaningful factor for us in the guide is thinking through how we kind of grow through that growth uh, from 2020. So there's probably still a little bit of that pull forward dynamic in the early parts of 2021, and then you know more broadly, Kanan, it's um, it's just so difficult in this time. I mean, this is one of the more uniquely challenging times, not just for life, but that's most important, but also obviously in terms of trying to just forecast the growth trajectory of a business. There's just so much uncertainty right now. So um, it's more uncertain than we've ever seen. Uh, and we're trying to forecast through that. Uh, but at the same time, one thing that that's maybe um, counterbalancing that is that what COVID has done for the, us is it's accelerated that big shift from linear to streaming entertainment. So the long-term growth trajectory is at least as strong as ever. There's just more short-term noise and uncertainty right now, but still very strong underlying growth metrics. And that's what you're seeing in the Q1 guide. Perfect. And I guess if you just look at uh, the full year in terms of cadence, uh, 21 obviously has tough comps versus 2020. Uh, but I think one of the things you guys also indicated was potentially a four to five million pull forward uh, into uh, 2020 from a growth perspective. And I think there's been a lot of debate about what you actually meant by that four to five million. So if you could just contextualize the guidance for Q1 more in the context of 2021, um, you typically do 28, 30 million subs in a given year. Uh, is that framework more or less intact or you know, should we read that four to five million comment as a pull forward into 20? Well, look, I, you know, I'll, you know, I'll take this one. Other, others can jump in as well. I, unfortunately, Kanan, we're, we're just, we're not gonna provide um, a, a full year guide. I mean, just as we talked about, there's so much uncertainty in the business. It, we can provide a number, but I'm not sure it'd be worth, it would be that bankable, right? I mean, it's, it's hard enough to project the next 90 days, let alone the next 12 months. What we uh, feel very good about, as I said, is that longer term growth trajectory. You've seen us, as you, you've pointed out, the historical growth trends, uh, you know, hopefully it'd be plus or minus that, but it, it's, it's a bit impossible to predict. What we do see is that viewing is up, in every region of the world, it's kind of returned from those peak COVID levels, but it's up year over year in all regions. Um, retention is better than it was a year ago. Acquisition is strong. So the underlying metrics are strong in the business, but I don't want to provide false precision on a 12 month target. Got it. And if you could touch on a couple of regions, I mean, um, the one thing that stood out during the quarter, of course, as you can, uh, where most of us thought the market was saturated, but you guys keep, uh, accelerating growth despite price increases, which is even more impressive. Uh, and then the other region, which, uh, you know, till Q3 seemed to be, you know, despite the benefit of COVID, seemed uh, to have slower growth than 2019, um, despite the market not being saturated. So if you could just talk about the underlying trends in some of these markets and what you're seeing, uh, which is driving some of these trends that might be useful. You want me to go or someone else want to go? I don't want to. Sure. Uh, you know, okay, I'll I'll go again, Kanan. Um, you know, I think uh, the story is pretty similar throughout the world. Every country is a little bit different, but what we're seeing in terms of 
you know, our viewing trends are, are similar around the world. The types of content that our members are viewing is kind of similar pre-COVID and post-COVID. Obviously, we have more and more variety of content and great experiences that we're offering to our members. Um, but you know, the, the story is pretty similar. As you know, there are certain countries around the world where we're just further along in our content market fit and our maturation. But we're seeing growth everywhere. I mean, even so, like you pick Latin America as an example, one of our more mature markets, you look over the past few years and we've been steadily growing about five to six million paid net ads a year. As you mentioned, in the kind of US, you can market, we're roughly 60% penetrated and we're still growing. So we're still a very small share of even just pay TV penetration in most markets around the world and small share of viewing. So we think we've got a lot of headroom in all these markets. And we're just trying to get a little better every day. And on, if you take the US being our most penetrated market, um, we're still under 10% of television viewing time is Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, so again, there, you know, we've got a lot of subscribers um, here in the US but we still have a lot more viewing time that we would like to earn with an incredible service and incredible content. You got it. And Spence, maybe one last financial question and we'll get this out of the way and get into the more interesting part of the discussion, but... Uh, <laughs> but I won't take offense to that last comment. No, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the one thing obviously which is new, uh, uh, in the letter this quarter is the cash flow guidance and your cash flow guidance is better than what you guys initially indicated and the buyback guidance. So maybe you could talk about capital allocation and uh, uh, using the cash for buybacks versus potentially other opportunities. And also why use an absolute gross debt number instead of a leverage target uh, to frame the buyback discussion. So it would be helpful to get that context. Yeah, sure. So uh, thanks. Uh, you know, we were, we're, we're, Super proud of where we are from a free cash flow perspective, and we we talked a bit um, internally before the calls. What was a bigger milestone for us to pass the 200 million member mark, or you know, kind of turning to this next chapter in terms of our free cash flow and the ability to um, self fund our growth going forward? And we we so we think that's a pretty big milestone for us. Um, to the point of our capital allocation approach, the philosophy remains unchanged, which is that we're we're going to be you know disciplined stewards of the capital and try to do things that we believe are value maximizing for our shareholders. Uh, but we have turned this corner where, you know, now we can, as we talked about with $8 billion of cash on On the balance sheet, projecting to be cash flow about break even in 2021, and then positive thereafter, um, we want to uh, you know return excess cash to the share our shareholders. So we won't build up a bunch of excess cash. Uh, we'll maintain, as you say, about as we said in the letter, and you mentioned about 10 to 15 billion dollars of gross debt on the balance sheet, and that's really just to you know, maintain familiarity and access to the debt markets should we need it, but there's really not a whole lot of science beyond beyond that. Um, and then beyond, as I say, we're, we put a premium on, on balance sheet flexibility. So we're gonna continue to invest, uh, invest aggressively into the growth opportunities that we see. Um, and that's always gonna come first, but beyond that, if we have excess cash, we'll return it to shareholders through, through a share buyback program. And, um... Reed and Ted, if we could just pivot to, um, you know, a, a question on competition. I mean, this question may feel a little bit unfair, to be honest, because in many ways you created the streaming, streaming template for others to replicate. But given Disney's recent success and, you know, the kind of numbers they are putting up, uh, it almost feels like Netflix is underachieving versus its potential um, and has to work a lot harder to get to comparable scale. So are there any reasons why you know, the Disney numbers are uh, not a benchmark for Netflix and why you got, uh, you know, the company can't get there. Underachieving, Kanana. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had to phrase it that way. 
in the bottom of our earnings, which is you know the return, the annualized return over 18 years being 40 percent. So if that's underperformance, so we'll do more of that. Uh, look, it's super impressive what Disney's done. I mean, it's the incredible execution, you know, for an incumbent to pivot and taking on an insurgent. And uh, so that's great. And it, it shows that members are interested and willing to pay more for more content because they're hungry for great stories. And Disney does have some great stories. And so it gets us fired up about increasing our membership, increasing our content budget. Um, and, you know, it's going to be great for the world that Disney and Netflix are competing show by show, you know, movie by movie. And, you know, <clears throat> we're very fired up about, uh, you know, catching them in, in family animation, maybe eventually passing them. We'll see um, a long way to go just to catch them and maintaining our lead in, you know, general entertainment, you know, that's so stimulating like Richardson, which I don't think you're going to see on, uh, on Disney anytime soon. Uh, Ted, you want to follow up on that? No, I think, I think when you talk about it in, in, in competitive terms, you think about uh, Christmas Day 2020, uh, where you have uh, enormously uh, anticipated film like Wonder Woman 84 uh, and Soul, both debuting on competitive services and us launching what turns out to be one of our biggest launches ever. Um, and I do think what it Reed said is it, it, it does point to people have tremendously uh, big appetites for great entertainment and all different kinds of it. And the fact that they're willing to pay more for more programming, I think is very encouraging. Now uh, we've always said that people will, we, our goal is we want to make everybody's favorite show, everybody's favorite film. Uh, other people are going to try to do that too. And people will supplement their Netflix subscription to get that content and which I would think is a super healthy dynamic. And can I, if I want Sorry, go ahead, Greg. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, but if I could just add as well, I think there's the membership lens and the number of subscribers, but it's also useful to look at it from a revenue lens, which of course is the, the fuel that we uh, have to basically create more of that content to get that virtuous Absolutely. cycle flowing more. And the only other thing I would add to that, Kanan, not to get too in the weeds on the numbers and not to take anything away at all from what Disney's done, because it's been amazing and I'm a happy customer myself, but you know, 30% um, of their, I think, 87 million paid subscribers were Hotstar, which I think we all sort of recognize as a bit of a different uh, service. Um, so that's, you know, so the 87 million is closer to 60 million and our ARPU is roughly double or actually more than double. Um, so we added close to 40 million last year alone. So I think when you factor in those dynamics and the fact that we're coming from a higher level of penetration, uh, globally, I think we feel very good about um, the performance. So you took the bait. Kanaj was trying to get us to chest pound some more. It was meant to be provocative. It turned out to be. But I guess, you know, follow up and Greg, I guess, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot to say on this topic. But when you think about Disney coming in or even Discovery or all these new launches that are happening, in some ways, uh, this expands the pie quite a bit for streaming in general because there are also new distribution models that are being attempted. Um, and telecom companies have started to see this as a new normal. And my guess is this will lead to all kinds of other permutations in the future. So when you think about you know, more streaming services coming out over the course of 21, does that in some way provide an opportunity to try new distribution avenues or accelerate growth um, because of the growth in streaming in some ways? I think you're right. I mean, we're seeing this big macro shift and certainly um, the the global pandemic has accelerated that process. Um, and really, I think, you know, the first bit is just even that big uh, impetus to move is to some degree a tailwind for us um, because we have more and more consumers who are around the world who are aware of these services. We have more and more intention, more activity out there. You know, we are seeking to be innovative um, and constantly pushing the edges around how we can, you know, accelerate our growth, how we can, you know, improve our distribution footprint, how do we access um, members more and more. And also, and what's really the key engine of our growth is just how do we satisfy those folks that have signed up for us? Because that really is the ultimate stimulus when they have a great experience and they talk, you know, wildly about, you know, how great the service is, how amazing the the titles that they're viewing there, 
to their friends, their family, their colleagues. That's really what motivates that next round of um, subscribers to sign up. So we'll keep pushing the edges. We seek to be innovative in that way. Um, and we'll, we'll come up with as many creative ideas as we can to grow. And uh, I guess extending on that topic, uh, you ran a couple of interesting experiments during the quarter. I think Netflix was free in India for a weekend and uh, in France, you have tried the linear format. So could you talk a little bit about the learnings from these experiments and are these successful enough to expand to other regions? Yeah, so StreamFest in India, I mean, the, the, the primary learning, uh, which was very evident, is that there's a lot of interest uh, amongst consumers in India to try Netflix. We had millions of people um, that had access for a 48 hour period um, to the service. And now we um, go through the, the more difficult part of actually analyzing um, how that interest through this specific tactic, you know, translates into sustained incremental growth. And we're still working through the details of that. And obviously based on what we see there will inform how we think about how we leverage that tactic again, or how do we improve on it? What other um, places we, we think it might be um, leverageable. And then um, on to your other point, you know, I'd say Netflix uh, members come to the service um, seeking to be entertained um, in a whole variety of ways. You know, sometimes they're looking for a movie or sometimes a TV show or animation or scripted or unscripted. And sometimes they show up and they're not really sure what they want to watch. And so we've had the opportunity to try and be innovative and um, try new mechanisms to sort of help our members in that particular state. So there's the linear feed is one example of that. It's still unclear how that's um, gonna work out. So we're still looking at that one. But I think a, a, an even better example of that is um, a new feature that we've been testing and we're gonna now roll out globally because it's really working for us where you know, our members can basically indicate to us that they just wanna skip browsing entirely, click one button and we'll pick a title for them just to instantly play. And that's a great mechanism that's worked quite well for members in that situation. Greg, are we going to call it I'm feeling lucky or are you going to come up with something better? We're going to come up with something better than that. So stand by for the specific <laughs> uh, verbiage. You'll see it when it rolls out. That's great. And so, Greg, just following up on Asia a little bit more, um, you mentioned the four to five billion dollars in revenues um, that Netflix has been able to add over the last few years. As EMEA becomes a bigger region and as your reliance on growth in that region increases, is that four to five billion dollars the right way to think about uh, revenue growth? And also, and because of the ARPU, of course, in that region being much lower, how should we think about that framework for revenue growth going forward? Yeah, I mean, we're proud of um, the sustained four to five billion um, annual revenue growth, which we we think is unprecedented in the entertainment industry. And you know, certainly our aspirations are to to do as well as we can and growing to continue to grow that revenue. Um, but to your point, you know, specifically what we're seeing is, um, you know, we have to find ways to improve the accessibility of the Netflix service. And oftentimes that means um, doing some trade-offs between, you know, subscriber growth at different ASPs. But really our framework for all of that and the way we assess um, the moves that we make and, the, and, you know, how we expand those moves and when we test how we evaluate those tests is really around that sort of revenue optimization piece. And so that's always the lens um, that we get to, and we're gonna use that to, to continue to try and basically fuel as much revenue growth as we can. And I would just add to that, you know, Kanan, just in this past quarter, the APAC region was the second largest contributor to growth. And you see, you know, the kind of revenue, you know, acceleration, frankly, that's happening in our business from about $4 billion increase over the, total year two years ago to about five billion this year and you know even just in our in our guidance for q1 it's i think 24 percent year over year so on an absolute basis that revenue is growing yeah and when you think about the apac region i mean obviously that's that region is very different in terms of you know price sensitivity and uh, the kind of diversity the region has languages and so on and so forth so when you approach that particular region um, is the present model more or less the steady state of trying a mobile only kind of a plan and then trying to upgrade people from there? Or are there other things you can do uh, either in terms of pricing or product uh, to potentially accelerate that? There are a hundred things that we can and we need to go do. And we know that, um, there, that it's really not just about just one, one trick or one thing that'll basically make us successful in the region, but it's just constantly looking at all of the ways at which um, the current product experience doesn't satisfy completely 
um, our members are members to be. And you mentioned language, it's a great one where, you know, even simple things like we're improving the ability for our members to tell us um, what languages they want, you know, um, in terms of the content when they're browsing. And there's sort of these different scenarios. There's a scenario maybe when you're by yourself and, and if you're multilingual, that can you know, result in sort of different choices. If you're in a multi-generational household, then all of a sudden that might shift how you think about like what titles you want to present and what languages. And so that's just one small example of um, places where we know we can improve the product experience and be more effective and satisfy members. But it, it goes on and on from that to like the methods of payments that we what we know we need to expand and we're you know constantly working to add more of those and make those more effective the partnerships we have that make the service more accessible and more immediate easier for for members to find out and sign up so there, there's tons of things that we're looking at okay. and uh, you know speaking of an area of overachievement instead of underachievement then 70 movies in a year <laughs> uh, <laughs> So now you guys are the industry in many ways. I think, you know, the top five studios potentially do about 90 movies a year. You guys are doing 70 a year. So um, at what point is this too much? How do you judge that balance? Um, and how are you juggling, um, you know, or how are you evaluating the returns on this investment? It's likely more than 70. That's just what we were able to talk about in that last release and that exciting trailer. Um, I mean, you think about it is you think about how diverse people's tastes are. You think about what the appetite to watch a movie is. It isn't just one a week. Uh, I think there's a plenty of room to grow that. Um, but if, and, you, and we're doing that uh, at much larger scale today. So thinking about movie stars like Gal Gadot and Leonardo DiCaprio and Meryl Streep and filmmakers like Jane Campion and Adam McKay and uh, Zack Snyder and uh, Antonio Fuqua make, Antoine Fuqua making films at an enormous scale for Netflix. Um, so that when people have an appetite to watch a movie, uh, they could do it at home and they could do it on the big screen or they could do it on their phone. Uh, and I just think that that evolution um, uh, will continue to grow and expand well beyond a movie a week uh, because that's, you know, the, we're talking about serving uh, a global audience with incredibly diverse taste. So that one a week is, you know, many weeks it's already two or three. Uh, and some of them are hugely impactful uh, in the region that they're created for. And some of them become very, very global, uh, like we saw with Hashtag Alive last year with, uh, from Korea, uh, which became a very big hit for us around the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you make these titles, I mean, you, know, you innovated with respect to the kind of uh, financial model on content creation with a cost plus kind of a structure uh, relative to the deficit finance models in the past uh, for content. Um, when you do the kind of output that you're doing and the volumes that you're doing, um, is there a risk that uh, uh, this leads to lower returns over time? Because there is really no downside in some ways for studios to create this content on a cost plus basis. Um, and does it make sense at this scale versus when you were essentially uh, doing originals as a startup? I think it does. I mean, we're seeing it scale up you know, more than double every year and it continuing to scale both in the uh, scope of the projects, the ambition of the projects, and the execution of the projects. And I do think the financial return, if you think about it relative on a handful of titles uh, that wind up doing an enormous return for the studio versus the hundreds of titles that barely break even, uh, this is a great model for producers to produce in. And uh, the fact that we can support it uh, day in and day out at this kind of volume uh, and, do, and make projects that are otherwise pretty difficult to make in some cases, um, it's been really encouraging for filmmakers to, to embrace this model. Got it. And, you know, given the kind of, you know, volumes that you're doing on movies now, and also because of COVID, there's been a, a, a significant shift in the release patterns for movies, not just, you know, at Netflix, but across the industry. Um, does this in some ways create essentially a new distribution channel for you? If day and date releases or shorter windows become more acceptable, um, does it become possible for you to essentially tap the box office with wider releases on a very short window? Uh, and does that become a new revenue stream at some point? Can I potentially, I mean, we've looked at this before, we've never had any issue with movies being in theaters. Uh, our biggest issue has been that you had to commit to this very long window of exclusivity to get access to any theaters. Uh, that's been the biggest challenge. So if those windows are gonna, going to collapse and we'd have easier access to films, uh, to show our films in theaters, I'd love to have consumers be able to make the choice between seeing it out or seeing it at home, uh, which is becoming the norm uh, in, during COVID, certainly. And we'll see how, how much that sticks. 
But I think that, you know, consumer behavior, human behavior, uh, things change a lot over time. But, you know, there's a very different experience uh, associated with going out and going to the theater with strangers and seeing a movie. And it's fantastic. It's just not core to our business. Right. And ho hopefully with <clears throat> Warner Brothers sort of COVID move, what we'll see is post COVID, like the second half of the year, is that people both go to the theaters in, in significant numbers and watch their films and they're premiered simultaneously on, on HBO uh, Max. And then that will really set a path for simultaneous, you know, is good for the film, helps both online and in, on streaming and then also in the theaters. Yeah. But we have to wait to post COVID to get a clean read of that. Yeah, so what you're seeing today though is exactly what we've been trying to do for a couple of years uh, mm -hmm. since we've been making these films of this size. I guess the other side of this coin is uh, given your distribution scale now, if a studio uh, wanted to release a movie on Netflix, uh, this is one of the most efficient channels they can get to. Um, why is that not an attractive model for Netflix, uh, either in the form of uh, a premium VOD channel or some other distribution model, but uh, why is that not an attractive model for you? I'm not, we're not saying that it isn't, but we're saying is this one has been the most attractive model. So in terms of both for consumers uh, and for our own business. And kind of, I think you alluded maybe to a different model, uh, sort of a transactional kind of approach. And I would say that we, we really believe that from a consumer orientation, the simplicity of our, you know, ad free, no additional payments, one subscription is really, really powerful and really, really satisfying to consumers around the world. And so we want to keep emphasizing that. Got it. And it's, it's interesting when you challenge the people to figure out one of the great things about the subscription models, I think it opens up uh, for consumers to be much more adventurous about what they watch. So mm -hmm. I think you can throw out a lot of preconceived notions about what works and what doesn't, because those are mostly established by uh, business trends, not by consumer trends. And what, so I think what happens is people say, hey, I don't, I don't watch foreign language television, but I've heard of this show called Lupin and I'm super excited to see it. And it's included in my subscription, my push play. And 10 minutes later, all of a sudden they like foreign language television. So it's a, it's a really incredible evolution. Um, Bong Joon-ho said it so beautifully at the Oscars uh, that uh, audiences have to get over the one inch wall to enjoy a whole another world of entertainment. And we're seeing that at incredible scale already uh, by watching, you know, by, by having great stories from anywhere in the world to everywhere in the world on Netflix. And that one inch wall is the subtitles, or you can watch it with dubs, or you can watch it in the original language track. And I guess when you have, you know, this kind of uh, content volume and also the kind of movie slate that you're, uh, you're putting up, um, it also gives you a lot more pricing power uh, because instead of uh, watching a movie for $10 or as a family for $30, you essentially pay for Netflix. So your pricing power implicitly goes up in this environment uh, because of the kind of product. I, that's where we're increasing value. We're increasing the value proposition for the consumer. Uh, every time we get a, another 10 minutes of, watching on Netflix, you're increasing the value of that subscription. So I think it's a, it's a that's by in, incre increasing the options, we are also increasing the likeliness that you're gonna push play. And when you do push play, you're gonna love what you see. And can I, realistically, out of home entertainment, it's just most consumers think of that differently, just like you could cook cheaply, but people still go out to dinner. Right. And you know they still go out and they see that as an experience that's just different. Um, so don't think of that as the direct, or our members don't think of that as the direct comp, but what they love is for a low price, they get to watch an unlimited amount and be very experimental back to what Ted was saying in their taste, you know, and to try Alice in Borderland, you know, and to try Lupin. So it's all these things are, are kind of interconnected, uh, to be able to create a really unique and incredible viewing experience. Thanks. I guess when you think about uh, these factors, I mean, there are two ways to think about pricing in this environment. Right? One is when you have so much competition uh, and consumer wallets essentially have to be spread more widely. Uh, one way to read the environment is to say that pricing power is limited, but then on the other side of it, uh, your share of total engagement could continue to go up and the pie itself could increase and you have more product which consumers, basically that wallet is coming out of somewhere else instead of uh, television. Which of these two uh, dynamics should we expect to see? In other words, should pricing power accelerate or uh, ARPU growth accelerate in the coming years, uh, at least in the Western markets? 
Yeah, I would say our competition set we think of as extremely broad, whether you think about it as, you know, share of wallet or share of time and attention, share of entertainment, share of delight. Um, and we, we feel like we have, you know, so much more room to grow and to grow. And really, it's exciting to now see these sort of new dimensions of value creation for our users, like bringing a foreign language show, Dupin, Casa de Papel, shows, you know, that are now becoming global hits you know, from countries and in languages that that's never happened before. So that's super exciting to see that kind of value creation. And that's really just, you know, where we stay focused. So we're not trying to predict, you know, the, the future in that way, but just stay tightly, tightly disciplined on trying to think about what's that next incremental step where we can create more value for our members, engage them, delight them, more great content, more great product experiences. And if we think we do that well, then we think you know our business will grow in turn. And Kanan, we're, we've been pretty cautious and we'll continue to be pretty cautious. Um, so maybe Spencer, Wang, can you re remember the, what's the last three years, what's happened with average uh, revenue per member? Was it moved up from? Yeah, so it's moved up from less than $10, uh, so around sort of $9.90 um, uh, per, per, uh, per month per membership to um, in the last quarter slightly north of $11. And just bear in mind, Kanan, I think you know this, but we had significant FX headwinds over that course of time too. Um, so so we've seen that you know grow steadily. Um, so that's, I think, a helpful framework for you. So that was maybe 10%, yeah, it's about 10% over three years. Yeah. Um, so pretty cautious and, you know, it's working well for us to provide incredible value. Yeah. And maybe just another way of stating that the cautious is just thinking about it. We do think we're an incredible entertainment value and we want to remain an incredible entertainment value. Yeah. And I, I draw you back to that Christmas day, uh, releases where we have that, we have a Bridgerton, but a couple of days before that we had midnight sky and a couple of days after that we had Cobra Kai and a couple of days after that we had Lupin and a couple of days after that. You had pieces of a woman. I mean, it's a phenomenal, and you can see the numbers are, you know, are, are in front of you. The, the 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 way that people have a, have enjoyed these series and films um, has been unprecedented, and I think the rhythm and the pace of that um, has been really, you know, keeping up. And I think that is the the definition of consumer value. Exactly. And and just the recent data points, Kanan, we referenced it in the letter, but we we had price increases in the U.S. in the fourth quarter. We announced in the U.K. in December and. And we've grown nicely through that because I think to this point, we're continuing to increase the variety and value of what we're delivering for our members. Exactly. And I guess on the pricing front, I mean, um, at a certain level, the elasticity, I mean, there's some academic, academic research on this, but essentially elasticity seems to be a function of the price itself, which means as you go higher and higher, then you start taking price up, potentially maybe the elasticity of demand changes. But is that something that you guys have seen yet, or are we still very far away from that point at which um, you know these factors kick in for you? Um, so if you could just talk about what you've seen so far as you've taken price up across different regions uh, in terms of potentially churn or you know cohort behavior, that might be a useful framework for us. Yeah, and I think rather than sort of that academic perspective, we look at it perhaps more practically and more operationally and really it's almost reversing it, which is that, you know, we are looking for signals and signs from our members um, that are telling us essentially that we have added more value. So you think about, you know, engagement with the service and retention and churn characteristics acquisition. Those are the things that we're really looking for that are, um, are you know, key to basically saying, okay, we've added more value in the service now you know, it's the right time to, to go back to those members and ask them to pay a little bit more so that we can reinvest it and keep adding it. So it's really that sort of, um, you know, iterative feel our way forward kind of orientation that we have. Got it. Um, pivoting to a slightly different topic, um, you guys added uh, Strive Masiwa, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, to the board. And Africa is not a region, uh, region we've discussed in the past, uh, but uh, Disney started creating a lot of content in the region, and obviously this board appointment is pretty interesting. Um, is this the next focus? How should we think about this as an opportunity? Well, um, Strive is a global board member. <clears throat> He's not coming on board to be a marketing consultant, you know, for Africa, although he does know it extremely well. Um, but he's a voice about how to build large subscription businesses, which he's done. 
He's enormously sophisticated of dealing with governments, which as we grow is an increasingly important skill for us to have. So think of him as a, a great global uh, advocate for us. He also you know, knows Europe very well and the rest of the world reasonably well. So I think it's, you know, uh, we've been broadening our global um, board membership and it's a continuation of that. And then, again, Africa has a ton of potential. We're doing more content there. We're growing our membership. Um, but again, that's not, uh, that's not Stry's role specifically. And just looking at the rest of the world, I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, small uh, transactions. And Spencer, this one, this one might be for you, and I'm sure the others will chime in as well. But there have been a couple of streaming services in Southeast Asia, which essentially were acquired by some of the Chinese internet majors. Um, Sony, of course, did the acquisition of Crunchyroll. So there's been interesting assets, uh, which could have helped you scale potentially faster. But obviously, you guys passed on it or did not uh, really show any interest in these assets. So could you help us think through um, what kind of assets you guys would care about? Is it more like uh, the Millar world assets or um, why are these assets not interesting? Sure, um, to answer the first question, Kanan, um, with respect to other streaming services, our view is you know, many people subscribe to multiple different services, so acquiring another one just for their members doesn't, um, doesn't really help us and we wanted to stay focused on capturing and you know earning earning that subscription from each you know person or organically rather than just doing some sort of m a deal um so that's sort of point one uh point two in terms of um your other question around what are we interested in uh it is largely around things that can help us you know bolster um our core business uh which is you know uh, entertainment and specifically content assets inclusive of things like intellectual property that we can hopefully turn into great tv shows and great movies I would just add that historically we've, you know, we've been builders, not buyers. Um, and, you know, years ago, I used to try to get the team to wrap their head around the potential scale of the business by saying things like, you know, someday we'll be so big, we'll have a, a VP of anime. Uh, and then that someday is now we're one of the largest producers of anime in the world. Um, so you think about those kind of things now, and it's like, you know, what would you, when you look at those assets, um, you know, they're primarily uh, distribution assets, not really IP assets. So that's what, and we're, we've been taking the approach like with our unscripted programming, with our anime, with our uh, animated features, with a big budget original film, uh, we're building a building in, uh, over, over a couple of years versus acquiring. Okay. Can I, yeah, uh, we have time for uh, one more question, please. You got it. Um, Spencer, maybe, uh, sorry, Reed, uh, I'll ask you this final question more with respect to uh, the longer term outlook for the business and Ted, uh, Obviously, feel free to chime in as well on this one. But is there any regrets you guys have had in terms of things that you guys could have done but did not do? And one instance that comes to mind is something like Roku. Uh, if it was part of the company instead of being spun out, um, and also when you look at the competitive landscape, um, what do you perceive as the real competition? Is it streaming services or does it come from outside, uh, from things like Fortnite, which you've mentioned in the past as an engagement driver um, uh, for consumers? Is that free? Uh, did you I, I directed to Spencer, so I was gonna, Sorry. I was gonna see how he does on this one. How was that? <laughs> I could take a stab at it. I mean, uh, and then I'll pass it over uh, to, to Reader or and or Ted. Um, so I feel like we, as Greg mentioned earlier, we think the competitive set is you know incredibly uh, large and, and wide. And so, look, I think we have uh, you know um, uh, you know a lot of work to do to continue to grow that small share of screen time that we have today to hopefully become more and more valuable you know to to our members. Um, I think the other part of your question was, is there anything that we sort of regret? I've only been here five and a half years compared to, you know, Greg, uh, Reed and Ted who have been here much, much longer. So I think my window of regret is probably smaller. Um, so I don't, I don't think that there's uh, anything that jumps out uh, to mind right now. Spencer's regret is not joining three years earlier. <laughs> when he could have. That is correct. <laughs> no, not materially. I mean, I think it is fantastic that we've executed. If we had kept Roku inside, uh, it's very unlikely they would have been the success that they have. What um, Anthony and his team have done um, has taken enormous energy and focus on their side. 
And, you know, it was an enormous test for us just to become a leader in both streaming and then original programming and then global. Um, so uh, I were happy for their success, uh, but no regrets on, on, on that front. Got it. I would think for the, with the, the hours and hours of joy we're bringing to hundreds of millions of people around the world and with the return to our shareholders, it's hard to look back with much regret. Here, here's one for you, Kanan. We regret not buying a global license to House of Cards in the first deal. <laughs> we, had, we had to go back and piecemeal at that extraordinary expense. That's a good note to end on, I guess. <laughs> thank you, Kanan, and, and thank you to all of our shareholders, and look forward to talking to you in another quarter. Thank you.